going to be talking today about what's called the English Decorated, rather not a term, but it has its period that produced some of the most beautiful buildings of our entire subject matter. It's been a long time since we had our last lecture, and I'm sorry to say that time has not done me any favors. And I'm not able to do these lectures anymore, including today. We'll have to cancel next week. I do that with great reluctance and much regret, but needs must. And I might have canceled today, but it seemed to me there was a far, far better alternative. We have among our residents Henry Matthews. Uh, what is it, 18 months? And uh, he is going to talk to us today about this material. He has uh, done a good bit as an architectural historian. He took a degree in architecture at Cambridge, which um, isn't you dub, but we can't have everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a well-respected school. Um, and uh, he has been a member of the Society of Architectural Historians and has taught at, at uh, uh, West uh, Washington State and other schools, and it is his native turf, of course, and he's going to conclude today, I think, with a building that is on the campus of his alma mater. I want to thank Henry for being here to help us today, and I want to thank all of you as well. You have uh, given me a chance to talk about the things that are dear to me, the things that I love. And that is a great privilege for which I am most grateful to you all. sad that Grant uh, didn't feel that he could carry on, uh, but we have been friends for many years, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you and with him. Grant introduced you very eloquently to French architecture, uh, so this is familiar to you here, uh, Reem. Compared with Salisbury, you can see that they're close together in many ways, and yet they have their differences, and the differences will continue in this lecture. And I wanted to start by making a comparison between French and English cathedrals. Now, you have to agree that every one of them is unique and different, and yet there are some characteristics that are particularly French, and others that are English. So let's look at the French cathedral plan at the bottom. That's Notre Dame in Paris. It's a little shorter than the Salisbury Cathedral above, but much higher, and you know that. It has the beautiful apse and ambulatory around the east end, that circular east end. English east ends were generally square, uh, which gave opportunity for great fine west windows. But uh, I think that the apse and ambulatory was one of the greatest characteristics of French churches. There are double aisles around Notre Dame, but only one aisle uh, on Salisbury Cathedral and, and most English, I can't think of any English cathedrals that have double aisles. But they were monastic foundations. The English cathedrals were mostly monastic. And so there was a people's church and a monk's church, as well as a choir. And, and so they added extra compartments um, for these various, various purposes. And then, because they were monastic foundations, they had a cloister and a chapter house. You can see at the bottom of the plan of Salisbury, the square cloister and the octagonal chapter house, and you've seen a few of those uh, already with, with Grant. 
So, there, as you know, there were three styles of English Gothic architecture, the early English, the decorated, and the perpendicular. If you travel in England with an old guidebook, it'll say, it described everything as EE, deck, or perp, and not everybody knows <laughs> what that means. Uh, but the word perpendicular is very appropriate for what happened. Oh, yeah. is, that, is that the next one? No. no. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so, just reviewing some of what you've seen, this is the choir at Canterbury Cathedral. The first Gothic cathedral in England began with Williams of Sens, the French architecture, and completed by William the Englishman. But if you go and look at the nave, you'll find that it's in an entirely different style. And then it's very common in English cathedrals because they kept on adding to them. They had a great cathedral and they would want to add something new. In this case, the nave was so old, it was a rich country in those days, and they wanted to rebuild the nave in the latest style. So it's in the perpendicular style. And that word perpendicular is really appropriate here. You see all those vertical lines and then the beautiful elaborate vault above. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong one. So Salisbury you're familiar with in the early English style, begun in 1220 with the tallest medieval spire in England added in the 14th century. And on the right, you can see the, those narrow lancet clear story windows and then the windows of the cloister below, which are the decorated style. It takes time to build everything and styles change while that goes on. So here's the cloister at Salisbury. <coughs> and as Grant pointed out, there's a lot of horizontal axis in Salisbury Cathedral. And I think he has some problems with the master masons there uh, who didn't do everything as he would have wished. But there it is. So here is a view across the nave uh, of Salisbury Cathedral with that clear story making a line of a, uh, of, a, of a horizontal nature accentuated by the dark stone shafts of what was called perfect marble, which was not one of the best inventions in the English Gothic architecture. <laughs> now, you have already seen Wells Cathedral. I thought I was supposed to talk about it, so I am prepared to do so, but I'll just go through it very quickly. I think that diagonal view from the nave from the aisle into the nave and across the nave uh, is just a beautiful vision of what early English architecture could be. And here's the nave with its simplicity. The, the ribs are just six to a vault. These are six part eight vaults. But then in the choir, which you've already seen, uh, the vault is in the decorated style. But we're going to see another cathedral in the decorated style, which far exceeds anything that was ever done at Wells. And then there's a look ahead to the perpendicular style in the vaults in the tower. It takes time to build a tower, and so by the time you get to building the vault under it, time has passed and new styles have come in. And you can see why those are called fan vaults. Though they look to me a little more like shuttlecocks than fans. <laughs> and this strainer arch was put in because the tower was showing signs of sinking. It was a brilliant device, but it is a bit of an interruption in the church. And then a retro choir. The English kept on wanting to add things, add things in new styles. So here we have uh, vaults with ribs named Tessorons. And then they are connected by shorter ones named Leerns. The Lady Chapel vault at Wells is another example of the decorated style. 
you can see how the windows are more elaborate at the top, though there are many per perpendicular lines below. And here's that wonderful staircase, one of my favorite places in the whole world, because it's sort of chancy. It, uh, <laughs> now how do we get, we, we put the chapter house one story up, how do we get there? And how do we turn a corner in the middle of a staircase? I want to go there again soon. <laughs> At the chapter. The chapter. But now we move on to Lincoln. Like John Ruskin, who is someone who claimed to know everything about art and architecture, declared the most precious piece of architecture in the entire British Isles. It's in a commanding position on the ridge of a hill. Uh, the main part of the town is on the top of that hill. And you see it from a long way away. And you see its central tower, uh, which is immensely high. But on top of that, believe it or not, there was a spire. And that spire, 525 feet to the top, was actually the tallest building in the world. The Great Pyramid is definitely left standing, um, left, left sitting while well, it stands tall. But that tower, the tower fell. Now Lincoln Cathedral was, was built to replace a Norman cathedral that was destroyed by, guess what, an earthquake. They don't have earthquakes in England, but this one did. And so perhaps they were particularly optimistic to build a spire that tall. <laughs> oh. You're going the wrong way. <laughs> so here is the west front of Lincoln Cathedral, seen from Lincoln Castle. Not one of the finest castles of England, but it's a castle and a feature in the town. It gives us a good view. We look at the west front, we see that there are three arches at the bottom, the lower two of which are distinctly rounded. The third one is almost, the middle one is almost pointed. And then above that is a great screen wall, which was built to hold sculpture. Now we know that there was a certain amount of iconoclasm in England at times, and I believe that all of that sculpture was destroyed. So there's a great sort of multi-purpose, multiple frame for much sculpture, and then uh, the two west towers that flank uh, the entrance. And here is the nave of Lincoln Cathedral, and you can see that compared with Salisbury and others that you've no, uh, there are more ribs. The additional ribs are called tesserons, and they give an added end energy to the architecture. It's definitely different <coughs> from anything we saw in front. Another difference is that there's a rib across the, all along the top, par parallel with the, with the length of the cathedral. And this was an Indian, English edition, not, never found in France. And at the intersections between the tesserons and the rib are what, what is called bosses. And we'll see some better examples of that before. And of course, a tower is a great place to show your prowess in elaborate ribs. And the vault in the tower uh, is really beautiful. It's like a wonderful flower. But then there's something really strange uh, at Lincoln. This fault is known as the crazy fault. Now, you, we have a lot of very intelligent people here, probably a few engineers too. I wonder if anyone can suggest why they did the vault that way. That way. Someone's got to know. <laughs> So if I ask that question, people, someone usually says they made a mistake. 
But it would be a mistake that would be very hard to make unless you were deliberate. And surely someone would discover what was going on before it went too far. So I think it's a precursor, precursor to an American invention, dra jazz. It's off the beat. <laughs> We move on, as always in an English cathedral, a new choir to be built. They were happy with their cathedral, so they wanted to add to it. So they added the Angel Choir, which definitely is the first step in the decorated style. The nave is early English with extra tesserons, but the Angel Choir uh, has a degree of decoration you see at the top of the two windows of the triforium in the middle level, there are little trifoil, three-leaved uh, openings. And then the upper part of the, of the clerestory windows are more elaborate. So this uh, is an extraordinary space and one of the jewels of English Gothic architecture. Oh, I keep doing that. Now we move to Exeter Cathedral, in which the decorated style really takes off with a vengeance. Here's a view looking down on it uh, from above. You see that there are no towers on the west bank of the west front, but two at the ends of the transepts. Each master mason seemed to want to make his own mark uh, with something like that. So there are two towers at the end of the transepts, um, transepts and a wonderful west front with a huge pointed window with a rose feature in the top. And then there are the pinnacles of the flying buttresses that add extra energy. Along the lower stories of the West Front is a great deal of sculpture and this is mostly intact. I don't know if some of it has been restored, but if you want to see as many kings and bishops uh, as is possible in a short time, this is one of the places where you can look at them. They are um, congregating there to give you a message about the glorious past as well as the hopeful future. Well, let's go inside to Exeter Cathedral. And this is an amazing sight because the extra tesserons at Lincoln were not enough for them. They wanted more. And so they fell out like more, if you had a hand with more than five fingers, you could perhaps do something like this. But they, they, then they echoed the, the sense of the ribs beautiful lines of action uh, by surrounding the columns of the, the nave arcades uh, with more ribs. So there's a cluster of, of ribs. And then as it goes up, they fan out in this glorious way. And something that's common in English architecture cathedrals is that there was a definite break between the nave and the choir as if we the people in the nave don't quite have the right to see the, the clergy of the choir so well and in this case uh, rising above that screen uh, there's an altar which very often appears as a major feature standing between the nave and the aisles. So I think I have quite a few pictures of, uh, of this. Here we're looking the other way in the nave, and it's slightly offset so that you can look down into uh, the south aisle where you can see the ribs for the smaller vaults playing the same game as those in the higher vaults. And the ornamentation is principally through the proliferation of ribs, uh, but there is elaboration uh, in the triforium, the middle level. 
we're not showing as much stained glass as I would wish to show, but we're focusing on the main lines of the architecture. Uh, but this uh, is the wonderful east window. Whether the glass is original or not, I'm not sure. Did you know, Grant? He's not here. Oh, he's not here. And here, some more views of those ribs. And then we'll try them in a different direction, going across our field of vision into the choir, looking back towards the nave, if we can see it with that organ there. And next we come to one of my favorite cathedrals of all. It was very close to Cambridge where I studied. And so I would occasionally make a little trip to Ely and climb up to the top of the tower and climb up to high places where you could see what was going on. And you can see that something very unusual is going on. Look at that feature between the nave roof and the roof of the choir, which stands up tall, an eight-sided figure in two tiers, it's like a sort of wedding cake. So there is the octagon at Ely, a unique feature, unrivaled, never attempted anywhere else in the world. How about that? So the nave, you can see, has very solid, solid piers. The nave is actually Norman, and it's still there. But you go from there to the lantern, or octagon, which is in the decorated style, and on to the choir. Well, once, when I was talking about the differences between French and English architecture to my students, one of my students said, well, Prof, how do you feel? You're an Englishman. How do you feel about these English cathedrals that don't have the unity of the French one? They're all bits and pieces added together. I was not sideways by this, but I said, well, they offer us an experience. You move through a, uh, through a cathedral, you haven't seen it all when you walk through the door. You have a series of experiences to enjoy. And later on I thought how to describe this. It's like a symphony in several movements. You go, you go through the nave, the Norman nave, and it's heavy and somber, and then you move on to the choir, uh, and it's glorious, uh, and so on. So, uh, I will take you on such a walk uh, through Ely. We come into the Norman Wave, look at the tremendously solid structure on the left. The second tier is almost as high as the first one, so we get the sense of those tremendous columns. And then there's a flat, almost flat roof, uh, which has been painted, it's a wooden roof. They never figured out how to vault it. But if there was but there was no reluctance to vault when we get to the next space, which is the oct octagon. And so if we've gone through the first movement of a work of music, we now we get to the Alleluia chorus. <laughs> so this is an eight-sided figure with eight points from which the Tisseron vaults spring until they meet another octagon which supports a central area and goes on up. I think this is one of the most amazing spaces in the entire history of architecture. How could they do such a thing? They had to search far and wide throughout England to look for trees that were tall enough. Now I think Grant told you that when uh, um, Saint Denis Abbey was being built, Abbey Sujet, uh, the bishop or the abbot who was the mastermind of it, told them how wide he wanted the nave so they would need beams that were, could cross above the vaulting. 
and the carpenters told him there were no trees tall enough. So he took them into the forest and showed them the trees that were tall enough. <laughs> and here, I don't know who, who, who showed who, these 60, 70, no, 60 foot timbers, 63 foot timbers, three foot square. And there would have to be oak. Oak trees tend to branch out and not go on with a tall trunk that much. And the span of the of the octagon from the eight points of support is 70 feet. So there we have one last look at that. Enjoy it while you can. I'm going to move on to lesser things. So there's a section through the transepts sticking out on either side, and you can see that the from the round arches that the transepts are Norman too. But isn't it amazing that they could make such a, a, an ensemble out of very, very different parts because they just got it right. So here's a view from the choir uh, back into the nave with the tisserand vaults and the elaborate choir stalls that they always had. They usually were niches in the walls behind the clergy and the choristers, and then above them carving. I wish I had time to show you more of the carving. And behind one of the transepts is the Lady Chapel, uh, which was a chapel especially for the worship of the Virgin Mary. And there is the interior of the Lady Chapel. And look at the sides. You can see that the carving is elaborate. Here's one detail from it, uh, which is amazingly uh, abundant in little forms. Well, next we come to York. Now, uh, Many of you, I'm sure, have been to York. Who's been to York? Ah, yes. Well, you can go again. <laughs> York, the ancient city of York, was surrounded by walls. And the walls are still there uh, around quite a bit of it. And you can walk along the walls and look down on the city and look towards the cathedral from various viewpoints. But then you, when you go to the oldest part of the town, uh, the next slide shows the shambles, uh, which was a bit, a bit messier in pre previous times when this was uh, where the butcher's shops were, and there was probably all kinds of offal all over the street and carcasses hanging up and so on. But now it's got quite cute compared with that. And while we're still in the city, I'll take you to the Merchant Adventurers Hall. I'm not sure what these Merchant Adventurers do, but some of them were probably up to no good. And York was a rich city, contained some ship owners, and the interior shows in carpentry the equivalent of what the wonderful stonemasons did in stone. This uh, is a structure that held an entirely timber roof. Not far from there, at one time I lived in a house uh, that was a blacksmith's forge. It was just built as a smaller version of this. Then I had the house next door from the 17th century. Uh, and I spent a lot of time climbing up on rafters, uh, trying to fix them together again after a while of neglect. So that's the Merchant Adventurers Hall. Here's a ruin of a small church that you see from the walls with a little bit of the cathedral in the distance. And I don't know why it's so yellow, but there is the walk along the walls. Uh, a wonderful place to enjoy the architecture of a clown. And we look from the wall over the roofs of newer houses to it's not called the cathedral, it's the York Minster. And I hope you won't ask me why it's called the Minster, because I don't remember. And here is 
the west front of York Minster and a plan fairly simple compared with some that we've seen, just one set of transepts, but they are large. This is actually a very, this has the widest nave of any such edifice in England. But look at the west window, immensely high, and then the, the tracery of the stone tracery between the glass elaborates above uh, in a wonderful way. So there are two, uh, two rounded forms, one above the other. I think I, I think I will show you a picture of the inside of it. So this is the west end, who at one entrance, but there's another main entrance to this very wide transept. It's extraordinarily wide, with three lancet windows above it. Now, in 1984, there was a terrible fire. Three o'clock in the morning, they started in one of the transepts, and a great deal of the roof was soon catching fire. But somehow. They had a whole fire safety plan for the cathedral, but it, the fire got away from that. And they managed to put the fire out before the whole cathedral was destroyed, as was Notre Dame in Paris. And I went back there maybe about 10 years after that, and it was absolutely amazing what they had achieved. They had also discovered that the central tower, which looks so firm there, was actually sinking into the ground. And I wish I had the photographs I took when I visited them. We visited it, but I can't find them. But they have an elaborate system under the tower where there are four sets of monstrous jacks, like you use for jacking up your car, underneath the four corners of the tower. Since the ground was subsided, how do we know it won't subside again? Uh, so they installed these jacks, uh, which are moved by hydraulic power, uh, and they, they constantly monitor the level. And if one corner needs to go up a little, they can do it. Good old English know-how. <laughs> Oh, did I? I didn't show you this before, did I? Well, this is the fire. It's a terrible situation. And as it got light, it was still burning. And then here is the name of, of York Minster. Actually, the widest nave in England. Only by short way, I don't, I'm not too good on dimensions. I can't tell you exactly how wide. <laughs> to my mind, the vaulting, with its slight elaboration at the top with extra leons between the tesserons, is not as fine as we've seen in Exeter and Lincoln. Um, the space is glorious. The verticality, wonderful, uh, but I think that that is not the best. Here's another view of the nave uh, and the choir. The choir is more elaborate than the nave, but it seems to me to be elaboration for its own sake rather than the expression of a dynamic structure. So that's playing around with ribs and tesserons. And if we skew it, despite the fact that the picture's a bit fuzzy, that gives you another view. And then we come to the chapter house, which is actually ten sides, is it? No, it's, it is. 
One of them is ten-sided. I thought it was this one, uh, but it's eight-sided with eight huge windows around it in the decorated style. Well, only seven because one is up against the body of the church. So you can see in the next picture uh, that, that that one is closed off. But the sun, does anyone notice anything different here from the other chapter houses? Look, no hands. It doesn't have a central um, support at Salisbury and Wells and many other places you've seen. There's a support in the center and, and ribs pointing out from it to the outside. But this is an amazing feat of daring. Well, now we get to my own home ground. Uh, this is King's College Chapel at Cambridge. My college, Trinity, was just a little further to the left uh, and a short walk from me. And sometimes I used to go and listen to even song in King's College Chapel. I had a couple of friends who were in the King's Choir who later became successful opera singers. But the choir is one of the amazing additions to the cathedral. I should have brought a music player so we could hear it while we look at this. But here we are at the outside. That could be me in the punt, but I was taking the picture, so it probably isn't <laughs> as many years later. But some friends and I uh, brought our own punt, and we had it on the river, and we had lunch on it every day. My wife is convinced that we never did any work, but we did, we did, but we enjoyed our lunches and invited people. Please may I come to lunch with you on the, on the pump? Well, if you bring a piece of cheese, that's okay. <laughs> and then we come to the long side, which is very different from any other cathedral. No transepts, no aisles, immensely tall windows that there are little side chapels along the lower level, uh, but from there the windows rise sheer through a long, long way. And then between them are the ribs, and on top of the ribs, the pinnacles. So what is the point of the pinnacles? Are they just decoration? The roof is trying, is trying to push the buttresses over. But if we can put a little more weight on top of them, then they will stand. And there's a wonderful view uh, along the top of the roof, flanked by these pinnacles and the slightly higher ones at the corners. Now, one of the traditions in Cambridge is climbing up the buildings at night. The night climbers of Cambridge uh, probably still going strong. I had a friend who was one of them. I never climbed a pinnacle in my life, uh, but he was um, often up here. And one day he fell from on a different at a different college. He fell quite a long way and broke his leg. And his friends who were with him said, "We'll call them. We'll call. We'll, we'll call the for help." He said, no, you won't. We will do deal with this ourselves. You go and get what we needed to lower me down. Uh, and uh, he went to hospital and said he fell downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and the vaulting is absolutely incredible. These are fan vaults. So unified and simple in a way. There's no little tesserons dancing around in an elaborate pattern just for fun. Everything here is for a purpose. <coughs> here, looking at one side, and you can see the height of the windows and also the brilliance of the glass. Now, the glass was not put in 
until the 16th century. Uh, the patron of this cathedral was Henry VII. Uh, we'll see another building uh, by, by him in a few minutes. But Henry VII uh, was the king who paid for or raised money for this from other people probably. And so by the time the structure was built, we'd come to the 16th century, and that's when the glass was put in. And you can see that it's rather different from, you know, it's under a Renaissance influence rather than the plain, the, the, the smaller panels of glass that we've seen in other medieval cathedrals. One of the traditions of King's College is to give a service on Christmas Day. Has anyone here listened to that service, which you would sometimes get on the radio? Yes, a few. It's a service, a service of carols and readings. And it begins always in the same way. The one small chorister, a boy, of, a boy whose voice, voice is not yet broken, sings once in Royal David City, all by, all by himself as a solo, once in Royal David City stood a lowly cattle shed where a mother laid her baby with a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ, the little child. And it's very, very striking to hear this small voice echoing through the whole church, the whole chapel, as I suppose it is, um, and then the rest of the choir joins in with other music. If there's any way that you can find out how to listen to that on Christmas Day, uh, I recommend it. Um, you remember the Saint Chapelle in Paris, the small chapel? It seems to be almost all glass. If you look up in this picture here, uh, you, you can see that the walls are almost all glass with just these vertical supports between them, you have no inkling of the buttresses behind them. So there's a most amazing sight. I will be there in about three weeks. One more building, another one by Henry, the, commissioned by Henry the Seventh. You can see from the left-hand picture where we are, that's Big Ben, and a bit of the Houses of Parliament, and then to the right, the towers of Westminster Abbey, and the nearest part of Westminster Abbey is one of those English add-ons, which you've already seen many. Now, the West Front was not completed until the 17th century. It was designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor, who was uh, um, pupil of Sir Christopher Wren and his right-hand man, who carried on as the royal mason after Sir Christopher Wren's death. So it's not, and he studied his Gothic, but it's a slightly different design. And here's the plan, the nave, and transepts, the arms pointing out east and west, and then beyond that, the chapel, which contains the tombs of the kings of France, and then beyond that, yet another chapel of an unusual shape. And indeed, like the French ones, it has a rounded east end, and that is Henry the Seventh Chapel. Then, to the right, is the cloister and above it, the chapter house. So it's worth seeing all of those spaces when you visit Westminster Abbey. This is the exterior of Henry VII's chapel with elaborate pinnacles on the flying buttresses, which are sort of structures in their own right. And then we get to the interior with a huge east window divided into three sections, 
some little tiny round bits near the toe. And this, of course, is also in the perpendicular style. But at this point, the perpendicular style went crazy. Because, look straight ahead. You see those elements hanging down? They seem to be columns that are not standing on the ground. They're flying in the air. How did they do that? Why did they do that? I think the next picture will give you a bit of a clue. There are ribs that arch up from the columns to the sides and pass through the pendant vault. And the bottom of that is carved out of one huge stone, which is part of an arch uh, that goes through it. Is this really the way to go? Aren't they showing off or something? Is showing off really better architecture than everything that was easy? Anyway, that's what they did. So this was the end of Gothic architecture in England, it had nowhere else to go. Now, in my opinion, the perpendicular style, which you saw at its height in King's College Chapel in Cambridge, is a pinnacle of European architecture. The French tended to elaborate for the sake of elaboration, not in this crazy way, but in their own way. Whereas the few perpendicular buildings St. George's Chapel, Windsor, Bath Abbey, and a few others uh, have this absolutely amazing architectural consistency. And so we've been celebrating the perpendicular style. So I think that it's fair that I should end up with the Houses of Parliament. The architect Augustus Pugin, who was a very religious man, believed that the English perpendicular style provided the essence of architecture uh, for England. And he played a role w with the other architect, Charles Barry, in designing the Houses of Parliament. And after, after it was destroyed by fire, and by the way, this is Turner's painting of the fire of the Houses of Parliament. Uh, I was not there with him, but I can imagine it was quite a sight. And this was what was built, and I'm sure you've mostly seen it. And this really proclaimed that the perpendicular style, which was intrinsically English, was the national style of architecture. And that's and what they discuss in there is some kind of national style of government, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Well, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yes, in the front row. That was a superb lecture. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you. Uh, OK, we have questions, and uh, Bob will pass the microphone on this side and George on this side. Uh, Erwin, you have a question? Yes, well, not a question. I just wanted to mention that if you ever want to see, I just wanted to mention that if you ever want to see Ely Cathedral in its absolutely best way, in the summer you can take a boat trip from Cambridge up the Cam River to Ely, and you see it from a little speck until you see it in all its glory. Okay. I never knew that. that that's in, perhaps it, when I was at Cambridge they didn't do that. I don't know. I'll do it next month. <laughs> you know, this month. Yes. Well, there's a question here. Am I on? 
Do you want to talk about the morning the North Tower fell up, fell down at Ely Cathedral? <laughs> People woke up in the morning and the whole tower had fallen down. Yeah, that's true. Um, maybe you know more about it than I do. No, I just know that it happened. I don't know anything about the, the circumstances. Yes. Well, I could go back to where it's missing. Oh, and they didn't rebuild it? Oh, North Tower. Well, I don't know everything, that's for sure. But if we go to the West Front, oh, yes. there, there, there obviously should be symmetry here. Yes. What went wrong? Uh, was the, what, were the Twin Towers around a short transit? the end of a short run that never built? I don't know. But it's 30 years since I've lectured on Gothic architecture. <laughs> so if I did know once, yes. We had an interesting experience at York Minster uh, about 20 years ago. We went on a tour there and had a very interesting gentleman acting as docent. And there were maybe eight or nine of us in this group. And after we went around the church, um, we stopped to chat for a few minutes. And uh, there was a very tall gentleman in our party who said that uh, his experience with York Minster came as a German bombing pilot. And uh, he said that the Luftwaffe was under orders never to bomb York Minster because with the blackouts in England, on the nights when the moon was full, they had to use the York Minster as a guiding point. <laughs> well, my, my parents, who were probably biased, uh, told me uh, that the Luftwaffe on the whole told everyone to destroy uh, everything they reported. They, they conducted raids that they called Bedeco raids. The pilot was given a copy of the Bedeker Drive, a guide, Bedeker Drive guide, and destroy something that was precious to the English. I think some of them would have balked at that. The English tried to miss the German cathedrals and succeeded on the whole in missing them. That's a biased story. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more question over here? <coughs> oh. over here? Well, I, I guess I would th thank you so much, Henry. That was superb. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have some more up my sleeve if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wanted to show you something. One. I have to lift it up. One day, um, I was told when I was in the School of Architecture at Cambridge that Professor Saltmarsh, I still remember his name, a fellow of King's College, was going to need a tour in the space above the vaults. You know, between the stone vaults and the roof, there's a lofty space. It's like a great barn. And so we went and climbed up there and walked all through it. It was very exciting. And then I walked out into King's Parade, the street outside, and looked in the window of a store, and I saw this print. So I bought it. And I've had been looking at it ever since. So if, you, if anyone wants to take a closer view of it, it will be on this table over here. <laughs>